Time Talk Radio. Today is November 21st of 2013. Hey, got to let you know that, hey, tomorrow, which will be Friday, my wife and I will be married for 11 years. So, hey, uh, God's blessed us. I have a great wife. We get along great. Um, and so I'm just really excited, you know, to have a wife that we really link up and we can, you know, think a lot alike, you know, different things that are kind of good. You know, we have a commonality. So anyways, uh, Praise God for that and all those out there that have gone before us that, you know, that your marriages are working just as well, too. You know, a lot of things are happening in our, in our country. Um, you know, we're in, in a, a kind of a sad state of affairs. And most people have not woken up to the fact that we're having some major problems in our country. They think that everything is going to work itself out. But we're going to have a great interview here. And before we get to the interview, um, I just want to mention a few things that are happening in the news. Now, um, Right now, I'm noticing that's coming up on the news is Navy yard shooter, that which happened here, I think it was last month. Documents are now being withheld by the administration. So, hey, what, what are they trying to hide there? Um, also, I want to mention that, you know, they had another huge fireball over Moscow, Russia. We'll find out uh, with our interview here if that could be part of ISIN. Um, matter of fact, I listened to uh, Clyde Lewis of Grand Zero. And I think it was a day or two ago, he said ISIS now is starting to flutter out like a angel wings. I haven't looked at that yet, but that's kind of interesting. Um, now, I know that Costco had just basically said they, they had labeled the Bible as fiction. Now they've changed that because people had um, come up in arms on that. So, hey, those things are happening. Um, let's see what else there is. Uh, U.S. may have let dozens of terrorists into the country as refugees. We already know that's already happened. That's no big news to us. Well, it is, but we've already known about that. Um, Dave Hodges, um, the Common Sense radio show, he's out of Phoenix, Arizona. He wrote an a, a article saying, America has entered into a new level of tyranny for the first time. I truly feel I am risking my life to write these words, and you are taking the same risk by re- visiting websites such as mine. Well, you know, and that is true, but you're going to have to trust God with these these things that are going on. Um, you got to be like Daniel, that when this stuff comes against you, you're just going to have to stand up and trust God. A lot of things are happening. Um, let's see, Euro Bank may move to um, negative deposit rates. You know, the bail-ins, the, the Dodd-Frank bill that happened here. Um, you know, start watching what's going on in the banks. If you're supposed to move your money out of the bank, do that. Do what God tells you to do. Um, Alabama police set up the roadblocks and checkpoints to take uh, blood and DNA samples. They said, hey, that's only by what people, if they want to give it, but it's going to be the point where you're going to be forced to. Um, you know, I can go on and on, but hey, let's go. To, uh, let's get down over there. Interview who we have, Jim Williamson, Echo, echoesofenot.com. That's echoesofenot.com. Now, now, I've known Jim. He's a good friend of mine. I've known him for, Jim, I think I've known you, what, three years at least now? Um, yeah, at least that. At okay. least, uh, yeah. um, you know, Jim, um, Echoes and Eno- Enoch, um, when I did interviews with you three years ago, <laughs> it was very exciting. Um, you know, everything with the Nazis, Antarctica, um, you know, a lot of things happen that people don't realize that, um, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you go ahead and give us a, uh, if you could take us up in a helicopter, give us a brief overview of your book and kind of let people know what, what your book's about. Well, I think there's several, you know, we all understand that there's going to be some end-time deception that if it were possible would deceive even the very elect. Fortunately, it said 
if it were possible, indicating that it's not possible. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the main thing is I try to bring out a lot of scripture to show that many current events that have happened in the last 60 years are already prophecy fulfilled that many of us are still waiting to have happen, but it's already, it already has happened. Yeah. And so I kind of show how and why. And as I, well, I, I've always been fascinated by UFOs and, and the idea of aliens and, and whatnot ever since I was a kid. I'm 62 now. So I was interested in this stuff back in the late 50s, um, early 60s. Well, that was practically at the beginning of all of it. Mm -hmm. Fascinated by the space program, watched and you know, followed everything all the way uh, through. And when I became a Christian in uh, 1974, I really had a lot of questions before the Lord as to how, you know, some of the realities of, of UFOs and, and how does this all fit into your word. Well, it wasn't until 19, about 19, well, about three or four years later that I started getting an answer. And I gave my first sermon uh, as an ordained minister in 1978. I gave my first sermon on Genesis 6 and showed how a lot of the ancient myths and legends of the past were actually describing the pre-flood world. And whoever these offspring of the sons of God and daughters of men pretending to be these gods were going to return and are returning and pretending to be aliens today. Well, I had only scratched the surface. This was 1978. I think at that time, probably um, I.D. Thomas and maybe uh, Chuck Missler and maybe two or three other people actually knew anything about that, you know, UFOs or aliens. So I had a basic understanding. I told my congregation when I gave that sermon that if and when I hear about this interbreeding or alien abductions or, you know, some kind of interbreeding program ever going on. I'm probably going to have to get back more into this. But for okay. for now, you know, I, I settled an answer. I saw this was negative. It wasn't a good thing. I had about three or four scriptures. And that was about the extent of my understanding. It wasn't until 20 years later in 1996, through a dream the Lord had given me, um, that he told me, he brought me into this starting to... Um, expand more on investigating and studying i it was an unusual time in my life i had i was working at a job that i made a fantastic amount of money had banked up and stored up a whole bunch of money and and when i, I suddenly i got laid off and this was right at the time when the lord had called me into this so what i did was i i i went on lengthy times of fasting and praying and i let the lord speak to me and guide me and and pretty much most of my book was the result of of the work Initially in 1996 and 97, I was afraid to actually proclaim too much until I could actually know that I wasn't going crazy, that this was all real. At that time, there was only two or three websites presenting any kind of biblical perspective on this stuff. The information was not out there because it was none of it was known. So I had nothing else to compare to. Mm -hmm. So I took my time. Um, speeding up, fast forwarding, it was 19 or I'm sorry. 2003, I was called to move to Roswell, New Mexico. I had a little store right across from the International UFO Museum. All the things that Lord had showed me and my investigations, I had, prior to that, I had traveled pretty much across the country doing UFO shows, passing out literature, and kind of getting my feet wet to see how much of this really was, um, if any of it was my imagination or how much of it was truly in inspiration from the Lord. As I saw good fruit coming, people coming to Christ, people getting reinforced their strength and are brought back to Christ that had fallen away. Uh, the time was to move to Roswell. And it was there that I really realized how well equipped the Lord had given me on addressing this whole issue. Mm -hmm. I started getting into counseling victims of um, um, alien abduction and other unwanted paranormal problems. Um, I got to meet pretty much everybody that was who, who both secular and, and uh, Christian research and studying similar like this. And from that, started formulating friendships and network. Um, the Lord brought me back to Michigan, where I currently live. And things have just gone exponentially just all over the world now, where I have a ministry that primarily is in cyberspace. But my main focus has been to um, to help equip those that are interested to in hearing more, learning more, um, new people that have a lot of information, how to help them get started in writing their own books, Um just encouraging people and then also the victims of uh, abduction or other things that the rest of the world, unfortunately, doesn't even or they really want to argue with me that it just doesn't exist. Well, I'm too busy taking care of those people and trying to repair the damage that's done to argue or debate with anyone. I won't debate and I don't argue. I just go about doing the Lord's work. And 
I'll let these people figure it out later down the road when they start landing on the White House lawn or however the <laughs> however the um, final coming out party will be, whether it be through a, a war, a second coming, um, a phony rapture. I don't know what the catalyst will be or a so-called government disclosure. Something is going to eventually bring all of this out in the open. It's going to rock most people's world. Those of us that have been concentrating and listening and connecting dots, prayerfully seeking the scriptures and finding answers in the mm-hmm. word of God, we're going to be equipped. We're going to be ready. And the Lord told me that that he is not. Uh, at one time, I thought my job was to help wake up the church. Well, no, he's when I was sitting there kind of a little bit depressed and wondering why I couldn't get churches in Roswell to back me up or support me in my efforts to bring a biblical perspective on UFOs and aliens. You would think Roswell, the center Mecca for all things UFO and alien, they would be interested in it, but they weren't. They were a microcosm of the rest of the world. And they had a lot of vested interest in the uh, tourist attraction. It was their main number one money thing next to uh, dairy farming. So uh, they didn't want that boat rocked. So what the Lord told me was, Jim, if, if all of my people knew what you knew, you would put a stop to things that have to happen. Mm-hmm. I haven't called you to wake up the church. I am going to draw those people to you that are like emergency support pillars. I'm going to scatter them around like salt and light all over the world. So that when disclosure, when this thing comes out in the open, it's going to look like the roof of the church has fallen down. But these people will be the pillars that stand in the gap to explain things. I'm going to send these people to you. You help them prepare for their ministries up ahead. Keep them encouraged. Keep them um in shape, waiting for the day when they're going to be called upon. Well, now, back even in 2003, 2004, there was still only probably two dozen websites presenting this kind of thing. And since that time till now, there's thousands. I don't know everybody that's involved in this now because it has just hugely grown, which shows me initially that we who are the pioneers did our work. We got the word out, and it's mm-hmm. been effective. Now, now hundreds and thousands of people worldwide understand there was a day when, uh, you know, Nephilim and people go, what? You know, they wouldn't yeah. know anything of what that was. Now, even people that don't know the Lord know what a Nephilim is. All they got to do is watch a few dozen sci-fi movies and play a couple of role-playing games, uh, video games. It's everywhere now. Yeah, you know, when you were talking about the aliens and stuff like that, I was listening to a radio show today, and it brought back to remembrance of Iron Mountain. Are you are you from, pretty familiar with that report from Iron Mountain? Oh, yeah. Um, it reminds me of a minister, Norm France. Yeah. He was probably the first one back in the 80s that was uh, warning people of the Iron Mountain scenario of a, an alien intervention and how it would impact, you know, the, the governments uh, of Earth. And their conclusion was pretty much like what Ronald Reagan uh, said, that if there was an external force, it would kind of help unite the whole world behind you know a common enemy or a common threat and um i think that's what we're beginning to see yeah but even even in new agers have you know it's it's funny how history will repeat itself when we were wondering what hitler was doing all we had to do was read mein kampf Mm -hmm. the strategies were all laid out there step by step exactly what he's going to do when the Japanese, you know, were going to try to take over uh, the entire Pacific and then eventually the whole rest of the world. And everybody's going, what are they doing? Well, the Tanaka papers were written up after a major naval battle when the Japanese had defeated the um, second largest navy in the world, the Russian Navy. Uh, this was back in 1903. Mm-hmm. So they gen- uh, a, um, a high-level officer, Tanaka, wrote out a 60-year plan on the conquest of the Pacific. All you had to do is read that, and the strategies step by step were out there. Now we've got the same thing. There's an end, untimed scenario. It's uh, a new age leader, uh, guru type, um, Peter Le Masseur, mm-hmm. uh wrote a book called the, um, the Armageddon Script, and basically it is for the accountability religions. In order for them to accept a one world uh, global government. We will have to fulfill their prophetic expectations. Mm-hmm. So he's basically saying that everything has to be played out as an extraterrestrial scenario to ex- to fulfill all of their exp- ex- expectations of eschatology, of end time events. Sure. So what I began to see, and I didn't see his book until after I already started putting the pieces together. One of the things the Lord showed me was that Jim, everything's being done in the same but opposite. So in other words, once you understand this pattern of same but opposite, many gaps in your information are going to be uh, filled in, and you'll see. So 
if you can imagine we're we're expecting a rapture we're expecting a tribulation we're mm -hmm. expecting um a second coming of christ and a um and a judgment and then entering into a thousand year reign so what i have seen in and backed and supported by scripture is a phony rapture mm -hmm. a phony tribulation a phony second coming mm -hmm. by a cosmic christ and all these things happening before the real events, so that in the phony rapture, new agers are taken, Christians are left behind, because what they're trying to do is turn the tables. Silly Christian, you didn't have it right, you got left behind, but the new agers have it right, they're actually fulfilling your expectations, they're actually fulfilling all your prophecies, because we're entering into a new age, the mm -hmm. millennial reign of Christ. So the only problem is, when this Christ comes back, a phony antichrist and a phony um, false prophet and a phony mark of the beast and a phony new world order is going to be put down by this cosmic Christ. He's coming back, not in a cloud. Well, the clouds of heaven, because silly Christian, the clouds of heaven are actually UFOs because Jesus is actually an extraterrestrial, part of an armada. And it's all of these ancient gods and goddesses that you thought were myths. They're actually real people and they're coming back because they're the angels of powerful um, government that's under, you know, under his leadership. So we have everything under a biblical veneer, kind of like uh, the Da Vinci Code. It sounds like biblical. It sounds Christian, but it's way off in outer space. So literally, um, it'll be using you know, UFOs and aliens as a good alien, bad alien with man stuck in the middle. And they're playing good cop, bad cop. They're both mm -hmm. bad. They're just duping us in the middle. Now, how the, the bad part seeps in, I'm not... I don't know everything. I just know that I've seen bits and pieces, and I know that somehow it's going to you know, end up that way. We're still going to have, you know, the, the wars and the, the turmoils and all the other things that are going to happen on Earth, and we see these things all happening right now. But what's going to intervene to be the problem solver, it's not going to be Islam. It's not going to be um, um, National Socialism or Communism. It's not going to be anything actually of this Earth. It's going to be something external. That's the only way that all the world is going to unite under one banner. It's got to be something outside of this Earth, something extraterrestrial. Because not everybody's going to buy most Islam. Not everybody's going to buy National Socialism or Communism. But they will accept some new superior form of ideology when it's backed and supported by superior yeah. technology and by superior beings. Then we go, ooh, ah, because why? Because science has now become the secular mind's god. Mm -hmm. You yeah. don't question scientists. If it's scientist says so, that's the way it is. Sure. Uh, you know, Jim, um, you know, with all this being, you know, talked about, you know, because, you know, we hear about Project Blue Beam that can be used. You know, you've been, I've been seeing over in uh, China where they're actually creating virtual cities. They're not there, but they look like right there. Mm -hmm. Kind of interesting that they can do that. Well, you know, the other thing, uh, side a side thing of uh, Project Bluebeam. I had a uh, a man who was uh, working for uh, one of the information gathering uh, private companies. I think it might have been Blackwater. I'm not really sure which one. But he, his sole job was to calibrate this machine and then go. They compartmentalize a lot of this stuff, so you don't. So one hand doesn't know what the other hand's doing. Yeah. Well, he had left something, so he turned around and came back, and what he saw was this beam or something being projected to a prisoner they were interrogating and this prisoner was thinking that Allah was talking to him hmm. and he was being told that it was okay to divulge the information and he said that as he looked through this glass plate to see in the room um, he saw almost like a, a transparent figure behind him speaking and it, it freaked him out and then somebody caught him there and they asked him what he was doing he said he had to go back to you know pick something up and they threatened him and told him to get out well he was calling me he was barely coherent he kept his mind kept getting scattered he was saying it that they had been tampering with him using the same kind of equipment on him he he promised he wasn't going to say anything but now he's not sure if he's going crazy or not i had about a two-hour tape conversation with him and you know I, i'm a nut magnet anyway doing what i do <laughs> so i get a lot of crazy stuff but yeah somehow the spirit was really letting me know this is serious listen hear the guy out so i got a chance to witness to him he didn't want to pray uh, the conversation got broke up. I never did know what happened to him. But then it wasn't too far um, later that I had read an article on the Internet about Bluebeam and how they're already using. Uh, Bluebeam also has a, a carrier wave that's on the same, uh, I guess, sound wave that our, that our brains operate on. And supposedly they're able to inject thoughts or verbalized uh, 
entire speech uh, structures to a person's mind. Um, apparently, they're using it in the, they've used it in the Gulf area where ships, uh, they, they actually tell people on the ships, they aim this thing uh, to people, and it says, what you're hearing is not your imagination. This is the USS something or other off your starboard bow. If you look to the east, you'll see we're flashing a light. This is us. Don't be afraid. We're speaking to you through some technology, but you need to turn around and leave these waters. This is a forbidden area. Hmm. And this, this has happened quite often over there. So I started getting letters, you know, from people going, oh, my oh, gosh. Man. With this new tech. So they're, they're using Project Bluebeam as a communications device to literally transfer uh, verbal speech right directly into a person's mind, almost hmm. like imitating a, a voice of God or whatever. So they're, they're using it in interrogation, but they're also using it as a general form of communication. So... The implication there and what some websites have even expounded further on is that they're going to try to uh, fake out the voice of God to maybe a mass majority during, let's say, a phony rapture or whatever. Well, sure, sure. you know, so I just started getting letters from Christians that read this and, oh, my gosh, what are we going to do? And, you know, terrified of it. And I started laughing. And I said, well, for us above anybody else, that should be an easy one. My sheep hear my voice. Mm hmm. If you already know God's voice, what are you worried about? We already got Satan whispering in our ears. We got our own conscious mind sometimes playing head games. You know, we being our own worst enemy playing head games. So what's the heck? What the heck's the difference of another additional one? Yeah, it doesn't matter true. if we have a right tight relationship with the Lord. We're going to be okay. I remember reading this was a universal application in context here. It says that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Okay, yeah, Project yeah. Blue Beam, mm -hmm. Harp, I don't care what it is. If we're standing on the Word of God and believe in God to see us through whatever we have to go through, what are we worried for? We above anyone else. We're in a win-win situation. And I think that, we have to look at that, whether it be Comet Ion or Comet Elanon or, you know, the next one. You know, to me, now, I, I don't want to play the devil's advocate here, but, I mean, I've been through Ion, I mean, um, Elanon. Uh -huh. That was a two years ago, and now we've almost got a carbon copy with Comet Ice on. Is there, you know, is this really happening? Is it breaking up? Or Well, something's happening. We're having yeah, a whole yeah. lot more uh, uh, asteroids and meteorite showers than anything that we've ever had ever before. That's got to tell you something unusual is happening in the cosmos. Something's happening unusual in the world. When we're getting everything from sinkholes to weird sounds to volcanic activity to earthquakes, more and more we're hearing we've never, you know, this is the world's largest earthquake ever recorded, world's largest tsunami ever recorded. Now we've got the world's largest typhoon ever recorded. I mean, things are ramping up. They're building up. They're, they're, we're having firsts for all kinds of stuff. We're having intensities of things. So there's all kinds of changes going on in the cosmos. There's all kinds of changes going on in Earth. It can seem overwhelming, and it can seem like, oh, my gosh, you know, well, yeah, it's, it's happening. I can't change ice on. Personally, Barry, mm -hmm. I think when ISON doesn't end up doing anything, yep. and then people are going to want more comet stuff or mysteries, can we please all agree to name the next one um, since we want more comets? Can we call that one Moron? Yeah. Comet, <laughs> moron. I mean, when is it going to end? We keep getting all this hype, all this hype, all this hype. Someday, eventually, something of Wormwood. It's going to hit the ocean. One third of the life in the ocean and on land is going to be destroyed. The Bible says it. I can't do anything about it. You can't do any. None of us can do anything about it. All we can do is be ready in our own hearts and minds before God. And then, you know, my concentration and focus, it's not going to be on, you know, um, the new Jerusalem is in Comet Ison. It's actually a spaceship. It's Jesus is coming back in it. Or I don't know what's going to come, uh, come of it. But I know that time is short. I want to bring as many people as I can to the knowledge of Jesus Christ so that I know I'm where I'm going. Yeah, and that's yeah. pretty secure for me. But I want my friends, my relatives, and everyone else sure, that I know sure. doesn't know. I want to be able to to redeem the time and reach out to them. So, yeah, you know, and that, that's very true. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to get into what's going on in your area in the United States. i um, um got a question that just came up here. Sure. From a partner that's sitting here in the studio with me, a silent partner. Uh, what about planet alignment? What have you heard about that? Well, 
like I said, you know, there's a lot of things going on. And, you know, when everybody was holding their breath December 21st, 2012, waiting for the end of the world, I knew absolutely nothing was going to happen. But just on a pure scientific level, just on pure basic physics, it's true we suddenly entered into a direct path to the center of the universe, not, I mean, to the center of our galaxy, where there's a big dark void, where most physicists believe that there's a black hole, which is the reason why a spiral galaxy is created in the first place. And if it is, then in my mind, I'm thinking, by a lot that I've read, not just, I'm not an astrophysicist, and I wouldn't pretend to be, but I do know enough of the scriptures, I do know enough of a lot of other dots connected, that this is serious. Something is going to drastically change during this time when we enter into this direct alignment with this uh, center. Black holes play havoc on space and time. Mm -hmm. I can show you in Revelations 13, where it says somewhere in the midst of the tribulation, time will come to an end. Sure. Linear time as we know it is going to come to an end. I, my mind can't even wrap around that. <laughs> I can't figure, but it's there in the Bible. Yeah. Now, it's not just, you know, I'm 62. I thought maybe it was because I'm getting older and now all of a sudden, you know, time seems like it's accelerating or getting faster. But you know what? I talk to kids. I talk to 20-year-olds. Everybody senses that things seem like they're just going quicker and quicker. And they probably are. Yeah. You know, uh, Jim, I, um, you know, even at work, when I go to work, um, you know, I work 8 to 5. And it just seems by the time I go to work and then come home. Uh, it's gone by so fast. Matter of fact, when you talk about time, Jim, I can go to bed tonight, okay? I'll, and in the morning when I wake up, I can say to myself, before I know it, I'll be back in bed asleep. And you know, I'll tell you what, it's just like that. It seems like everything is ramping up quicker and quicker and quicker. Now, I truly believe, Barry, that, that somehow... Part of our conscious mind is aware of this, but the rest of us, really, it really isn't because we're all progressively going. It's just like, okay, we're on the earth and we're spinning around and revolving. We don't feel it because there's a, you know, there's just a larger force that is keeping us, you know, anchored on this world. We're not getting dizzy. There's things like gravity and, and other things that are uh, playing into effect here. So it's the same thing with this time. Even though we're lined up now with, with the center of the galaxy, and it's having some kind of an unhindered effect, I think, more in space-time. Our conscious mind somewhat is aware of it, but the rest of us, life just goes on. It just seems like it's quicker, but we're not really sure. But I think, I remember two years ago, I remember seeing the moon. Now, I've always been in, uh, always had a telescope and always looked at the stars and everything. And, you know, 50-some years of looking at the moon in different phases and everything, and all of a sudden, I'm seeing it totally out of whack. It's clock different. The... Um, the phases are different in a way that I've never seen them before. Now it's back to normal, but yeah. there was like a shift or a wobble. Well, my Bible tells me in Isaiah 24th chapter that the world uh, just after the flood had wobbled like a drunkard to and fro. And then it says that, that God had taken those beings that ascended from heaven to earth. He put them in a pit and he took the kings of the earth, which were their offspring, put them in a pit and for a time until they're visited. The word visited is the same word used in Isaiah 26, where it talks about the um, the sons of God and their offspring being put in this pit. And it says, in kind of rhetorical fashion, it says, you are dead, you're not alive. You are deceased, the Rapha, which means the ghost of the, the, uh, the ghost of the giants, are no longer alive, and you will not resurrect. But then the very next word says, but he has visited you, and will destroy you, even that your memory is not, even that you're not even remembered. So the word uh, visited is the linchpin that connects that scripture with Isaiah 24. The word pakad means, has two different meanings. Mm -hmm. Some theologians tell you, well, it can only mean one thing. No, we have two other, many other examples where a word can actually have both meanings applied to the same text. I think that's what this is. Picard means to supernaturally intervene in the natural course of events. Sarah was visited by an angel long past her bidding to, to bear children, and she bore a child. The visited was supernaturally intervening. So Isaiah 24 is telling us that they are going to be put in this pit until they're supernaturally intervened. Now Isaiah 26 is saying that they are dead, they're not alive, they're the deceased disembodied spirits of of um, 
of the offspring of the sons of God, and they're not going to have a resurrection. But he has visited, means inter, supernaturally intercede on the prior statement. God's going to intervene. He's going to make them rise because the second part of that word, Pekad, what it means is to mm-hmm. muster up as an army. So these undead are going to be brought back into restoration. Job mm-hmm. uh, 26, one, or 6 says that. Daniel 2.43 describes even where it's going to happen, where they are brought back. But this time when they're brought back, they're not going to die like they did in a flood. This time they're an invincible army. Joel's second chapter says that a, a gathering together of, of, of creation that's never been and never will be again. They're the ones that are brought back up from inside the earth. Um, if you can imagine if they're locked in this pit, they're not literally chained up. They're disembodied spirits. How can you chain them? In, in uh, Jude and in First Peter, where it talks about the angels being reserved into everlasting dark, the chains of darkness, the chain there has another meaning as a cycle going up and down. We see that when we entertain any kind of a cult or try to get power or information mm-hmm. through any kind of a cult source. We actually conjure these things up into our homes, into our lives, maybe even into our own mo- bodies and minds. So my part of my ministry has been deliverance to clean up houses, clean out uh, a human mind or whatever the trespassing has been. So in the name and the authority of Jesus, they're cast back down to the pit. This mm-hmm. is that cycle going up and down. What's keeping there is is not necessarily uh, a chain. The, the word reserved into everlasting chains of darkness, reserved there means the, the Greek word paradatomai means that they're being held for a purpose, specifically in context of prophetic end or purpose. What is that purpose? To be mustered up as in this end time army. Revelations 9 chapter talks about this locust coming up, the same locust that Joel 2 t- describes. And it's interesting, it says that an angel has a key to the bottomless pit. Mm-hmm. And he puts this key in and opens up the bottomless pit. How do you do that? You know, with electromagnetic forces, everything about ghosts, about demons, about aliens, even UFO apparitions. The British equivalent to Project Blue Book con- concluded in their research that UFOs seem to have less of an extraterrestrial origin and more in common with ghosts, demons, and occult mm. activity. Why? Mm. Because of the electromagnetic no- anomalies that, that go along with them. Um, you know, the registering of uh, an intense amount of ozone, which also is electrified mercury actually produces that same thing, which is the key to uh, anti-gravity travel. This is, I mean, I'm kind of getting shotgun here, but sure, this is sure. all a technology and a science and a physics that can be explained. We're just beginning to understand it now. But this was stuff that fallen angels imparted to mankind, just as the book of Enoch said, that not only were they interbreeding with the human race, but they had scattered the secrets of heaven amongst men. What's the secrets of heaven? It's not magic. It's technology. It's science. It's forbidden physics. It's a way of doing things that in our mankind's fallen state, we got no business doing. Unfortunately, the first people to understand this were people that were into the occult. They were pursuing out-of-the-box occult ideas. And so they were the first ones to produce the ideas of cloning, the ideas Uh of, of circular disc and triangular disc aircraft. And that was the Nazis. So you go, oh, boy. Yeah, Jim <laughs> believes some really crazy stuff. You know, Barry, I had been saying that there was a Nazi connection to UFOs and their technology 18 years ago. Mm-hmm. People thought I was a raving loon. Um, nobody from a Christian perspective was saying that. What I brought extra to the table was the fact that I showed Scripture, how this was prophetically being fulfilled, and most of it being fulfilled back in the 40s that the Nazis were not dabbling in the occult. They were an official occult government. Everything they said, thought, did was all occult. I show in my book that there's a connection. Everything of technology that we know of a UFO goes back to Nazi Germany and the research they were working on. Everything that an alien has ever said, whether it be a Nordic, a reptilian, or a gray, all proclaim theosophy, which is the philosophical ideology of the Nazis, and it's also the same tenet of the New Age movement, theosophy having an Old Testament value based on bloodline and national identity, now offered to whosoever will in a spiritualized form if you believe that man can become God. So it's it's the same but opposite of everything that we're expecting or that we have seen done by God's hand through us. Satan is imitating the same things, extrapolating all that God did in a same but opposite way. So we have we have the abductions. We have the genetic tampering and experiments. They're the identical experiments that Mengele and others were doing 
during the Nazi regime uh, in areas of cloning and, and uh, gene splicing and whatnot. What's the last you've heard on those uh, gene splicing, those like the monsters have been creating in these laboratories? What have you heard? What's the latest that you might have heard or popped up that you might have come across? Well, the biggest thing I heard was, um, uh, and it was a cover-up, and quite frankly, I've backed off from it now. I have mm-hmm. a time travel in the Bible series, four parts, posted in YouTube. I also sell the condensed version in a DVD off of my website. But um, I investigated the Stevensville uh, light sightings, the flap sightings of nine, or 2008, and uh, some of the people that I talked to have now recanted and changed their, their stories from what they told me. A lot of people had seen a bell-shaped object in two globes with two bell-shaped objects. Um, the one police uh, captain there, Leroy Gayton, told me, now I met him, he professed to be a Christian. I discerned from the spirit, this man is a very honest, upright guy. He had nothing to gain and everything to lose by coming forward. He told me that he had a video tape that clearly showed two glowing bulbs, red glowing bulbs, and it had these bell-shaped objects inside. I asked him, I said, I said, Leroy, did the tape you had, did it show clear pictures of this bell-shaped object inside? And he said, oh, yeah. He said, I uh, I can give you a copy if you want. And I'm thinking, oh, this is great. You know, I got mm-hmm. a smoking gun here. And he says, but I gave the, the, but I gave the tape to Angela Joyner. She was the newspaper reporter that initially broke the story. And then he said, and she gave it to Linda Moulton Howe. Mm-hmm. And I said, and I'm thinking, oh, gosh. Lee, I, and I said, Leroy, please tell me you made a copy of it, though, right? Uh, no, that was the only copy. I gave it to her. Oh. I said, Leroy, you're never going to get it back. You're never going to get it back. And uh, Linda Moulton, how I'm going to, what the heck? She's the, the uh, cattle slaughtering mutilation gal. She, that's yeah. her expertise. Yeah. What's she doing with Nazi UFO stuff? It was later that I found out that she had been working with Jim Mars on some of the Nazi UFO uh, technology. So that was quite a deviation, and that was even kind of funny because I remember 18 years ago, um, maybe um, William Lynn and uh, maybe two or three others is the only ones that ever said anything about a connection to Nazi Germany with UFOs, and they were the laughing stock of MUFON and everywhere else. Now, all of a sudden, you turn on the TV, and uh, you have Jim Mars on Ancient Aliens saying that, in his opinion, that uh, the Nazi bell was real, Hans Kammler, uh, head of the programs and everything, escaped in one and went to another world or another time. Before he ever said that, 10 years ago, I'd been saying that Hans Kammler disappeared in one of those, and that probably uh, one crashed in Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, and the other two showed up in Stevensville, Texas. So this is a cover-up, and it's real. It's got more to do with Nazis than it does any aliens. All of your 50s contactees, the the um, people that they ran to were all Nordics. They were flying in Hannibal-type saucers. We had the uh, print blueprints from captured Nazi, Nazi documents. Everybody's saying, okay, and this is my first thought. Oh, yeah, right. So Nazis had UFOs. Why didn't they win the war? Because they couldn't use it as a weapon. Mm -hmm. You can't send a projectile from one thing that is creating its own separate uh, gravitational field into a different gravitational field. The forward thrust of that projectile is going to send that the UFO back spinning with an equal force the opposite direction. So they didn't have a weapon. All they could do was have a sudden startling imposing sign in the sky that could land, pretend to be aliens, and start preaching their form of theosophy, which is exactly what had happened, uh, winning the hearts and minds of their enemy. Um, I found that almost all your major um, contactees, had a, they were already involved in the occult. They were members of occult lodges. Um, and they also had Nazi connections and ties. So I thought that was rather convenient, too, that, that all of this is all interconnected like this. So in my book, I pretty much show how all this technology was not only part of an unknown part of our, our human history, but that it was also prophecy fulfilled. So I show all the scriptures of how all of this stuff links in and, and comes together. Well... That was why I called the book Beyond Science Fiction, Mm -hmm. and it's been something that a lot of people think is just uh, a little bit over the top. But now recently, I think it was just too far ahead of its time at the time, 18 years ago. Now, all of a sudden, people that I had talked to that far back have watched these programs on TV, and now they're saying the same thing that I said 18 years ago, and they're going, oh, wow. Maybe Williamson isn't so crazy after all. This stuff was, I heard it on TV. It must be true. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, thanks. I mean, I got all these scriptures to kind of support it. And you're a Christian. Why don't you believe that? But 
now that you see it on TV, I guess it's okay. All right, whatever. Yeah. At least yeah. I'm not looked. I'm not looked at as that crazy anymore because things are starting to catch up. Yeah, I still have two elements to my overall puzzle piece that is just beginning to be accepted now by other Christian researchers that have more of an expertise in that area. And I think on their engineering level, they're going to be able to do a much better job later down once they do the research that I have, find out it's legitimate, and they'll be able to fill in the gaps. And that is, these two elements are um, a hollow earth, the realities of it, and it's a missing element that explains some of the things, you know, in this end time scenario, the Nephilim, how they return and all this stuff. And the other one is time travel, the fact that it's already a done deal. Uh, my last uh, video series posted on YouTube uh, and what I also sell off my um, website is a four-part series. It's about six hours totally um, showing first I show all the scriptures of how God is in control of time, how he's been able to tweak and manipulate it forward and backward. So that takes away any theory. Could it happen? Well, it already did happen. God did it. Um, then I show the prophetic scriptures that there would be a certain person and group that would have access to in a limited sense of doing that. Mm -hmm. And so I show all of that. Then I show some of the modern uh, attempts by the Nazis and by the Americans and how we tried to back engineer and glean some of that leading up to even the symbology. Then I go to everything from the stars to more esoteric Gnostic stuff. But, you know, that's like the icing on the cake. My foundation is the fact that the Bible, chapter, text, and verse talks about it, explains it. I even in, in part one, I revert back and forth. I go to a text in Second Samuel, 22nd chapter. I show verse by verse how it covers all of the potential um, drawbacks and speculations and dangers. And then I, inter I have different clips of theoretical physicists that make these proclamations and then how it's answered in the word of God. Back and forth, back and forth. So step by step, I show and guide you through the scriptures how this is already a done deal, how it's already been addressed, how whether it's a grandfather complex or anything else. God knows about it. He's already addressed it. Here's the answers that he has. Now here's where we can project where it's going to go. So I have no doubt that whatever's happening on the cosmic level being lined up with this um, black hole that's causing a fluctuation in space time, probably the internal disruptions in our own planet, uh, weird things that are going on with our sun. All of these things are being interplayed along with the technology that, for, that fallen angels have given a, par a portion of mankind. They're, I think harp, blue beam, all these things are helping to tweak some of these natural forces more to the leaning that they want in producing uh, a phony tribulation, a phony, you know, a lot of these things were probably going to happen anyway, but now they're just kind of steering and directing it to where they want for their own purpose and their own agenda. Jim, um, now where can people get your book at? Um, I, it's on either Barnes & Noble or Amazon. Okay. com you can go there and and uh, you can order it i don't have any copies on my own i'm working on getting a a better deal but uh, that's going to be a little worse down the line yet but uh, okay. soon i'll be coming out with my own uh, cheaper um, version because i own the copyright sure well we'll be watching for that okay jim um some major hard-hitting things in america are happening you're up there by detroit what have you been seeing that's been going on up there you know, I'll tell you, the bottom line to all of this, man, is if we don't return back to Christ, if we don't put God back in our country and be uh, bold in stating that, yes, we are a Christian nation, yes, we're going to honor God, yes, in God we trust, we're going to believe it in our money. But I'll tell you, we got an administration that may stay in forever. They may yeah. not be going away. And they're hell-bent on removing God completely. And the more we take God out of our country— the more we're going to see failure. All you got to do is look in Deuteronomy 28th chapter, the blessings and cursings of a nation. What makes us different is because most of our history, in spite of what Obama has said, we were a Christian nation. We identified with it. And even in spite of our leaders, if the founding fathers were double-minded and were a member of the Illuminati and the other occult agendas, which I totally believe happened, God had his own agenda. He had his own earmark for America. In Isaiah 55, 5, it says that there was be a nation that that Isaiah didn't know that in that time wouldn't even know of Israel because it wouldn't be in existence. But but he would cause them to be raised up and from their immigration policy would cause people from all over the world to come in so that they would know about the gospel and about the realities of God. And I truly believe that was the United States of America. Mm -hmm. That's in Isaiah 55, 5. That was God's plan for America. Um, Satan had another plan. 
It was an occult agenda. It was to gather. You know, if you want to eliminate God's people, corral them all together in one place so it makes it easier to eliminate them. Yeah. So that was kind of part part of the plan. And the other plan was to reestablish Babylon, which might ultimately go back to the plains of Shinar. But I, I totally believe that today, right here and right now, we are modern Babylon. And we're fulfilling many of the prophecies in Jeremiah um, in relation to that, to that and in Revelation 19. So... Um, I, I truly believe, and I don't want to sound like a pessimist, because my actions, the way I'm going to respond is I'm going to do what's right, even because it's just the right thing, not expecting any kind of overall major change. I vote. I still vote. I'm a veteran. Um, a lot of people died to give me that right. Do I think my vote counts anymore? Heck no. <laughs> yeah. No way. But you know what? It's some. It's a privilege that people have died for to give me. I will go and vote, and I will vote the best moral guideline to those that best represent me. And I'm not going to settle for second best, the lesser of two evils. Evil is still evil, no matter what. But I will vote for those people, even if they have to write their names in, I will vote for those that best reflect the kingdom of heaven. And I will do it even though I know it doesn't do anything. If God should ever decide to change, he's going to change because he's going to use the obedience of his children. If we all vote, even though we don't believe that it's going to do anything, but we do the best according to what the kingdom of heaven is, if God should intervene, he can do that when we obey him, when we just simply do what is good because it's the right thing to do. Not expecting, what, anticipating, well, it's not going to change anything anyway. I don't care whether it changes anything. It's the right thing to do, and I'm going to do it. Jim, what did you do? Were you in Vietnam, or where, where did you no, do? I, I was, um, you know, I was going to be drafted, and the first thing that a high school kickout biker is going to do is be cannon fodder, 11 Bravo, Vietnam. My best friend was in the Tet Offensive, a door gunner in a, in a Huey chopper. And he wrote back the realities, and I knew, I just knew that if I went over there, I wasn't coming back. And I didn't want that to happen. I wasn't a Christian yet, um, didn't even believe in God. So I knew, uh, you know, I had other friends that had gone to Canada, and I actually had one that, that decided to resist and went to Leavenworth. I didn't want any of those options. So I figured, you know what, my grandfathers, my dad, my great-grandfather, five generations back, we all were in the service. And all of them fought in all of the wars, uh, going back to the Civil War. So I thought, you know what, I, I really don't want to be in Vietnam, but I don't mind serving the country. I'd be proud to serve the country, but I don't want to go there because I don't think I'll come back. So I went down, I enlisted. I ended up joining the um, um, Army Air Defense Command missiles. So I would have been, you know, pressing the buttons. I would have been part of helping get the button pressed. Um, what I didn't know and what they didn't tell me, I mean, I, I could enlist, but it had to be a four-year enlistment. And what they didn't tell me was that I was part of the rapid deployment service. In other words, I was on 24-hour call, never-endingly, perpetually always playing war games um, because the rapid deployment service was later called the Delta Force. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. I didn't know I was doing <laughs> that. Hey, that was. I didn't sign up for that. Wait a minute. Yeah. Uh, so we. But I was uh, attached to a in the rear with the gear kind of a thing. Uh, our missiles were not front line, so you know I didn't do all a lot of the hardcore crazy stuff. But I did have a lot of training. Um, but it was in the service that I had my first encounter with God. Um, I was not in combat, but I was shot at. Um, Oh, gosh, how can I do it? Well, I was in a classified MOS, and I had the lowest security level, but it's still our missiles were classified, even though they, they went back to, like, the 50s. So I figured, well, who's going to be interested in that stuff? Well, unfortunately, one of my roommates was ready to sell us out and sell an army SNA arming device to a Hawk missile to some kind of organization that wanted it. I tried to talk him out of it, and he wouldn't listen to me. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, at the time, I was had a little bit of a drug problem and was actually growing marijuana right on the uh, attack base <laughs> out in the Everglades. I figure the most obvious is the least suspected, you know. Uh -huh. And I had a friend who was the major primary dealer directly from the syndicate who was getting all his stuff and he he didn't know how to work on his motorcycle. I fixed his bike. He gave me a lot of free good stuff, helped me actually to get started on my own little crop. So we had a good, you know, we had a good thing going there. Well, the problem is here I am trying to be a patriotic American, and I had I was left with no other alternative. When my buddy wouldn't listen to me, I had to turn him in. I had to bust him. So I went into security. They made a big deal out of it. I didn't, you know, it kind of surprised me. They put me into this big vaulted room with a general and all kinds of top brass. 
and they interrogated me on everything I knew about what was going on. So I gave them all the information. I cooperated with them. Um, and the next thing you know, two weeks later, there's a major drug bust on the, on the base. So one of my customers worked as a clerk in S2. They saw, he saw me go into this vault room with all these top brass. Two weeks later, there's a bust. Who was the narc? <laughs> oh, Who do you yeah. think? Yeah, <laughs> me. Yeah. And the next thing you know, I had my friends coming up and my one friend, and they told me, he says, um, on the 19th, you better be ready to make arrangements with the man upstairs because you're dead. Wow. That's it. All these are my friends. They wouldn't do that to me. So the 19th came. My friend had an apartment off base. I drove out with a bunch of them out in the middle of the Everglades. And then I realized, oh, my God, this is real. They're going to kill me. So I pretended I wanted to get a pack of cigarettes. I went outside. They sent a guy with me. I bent down to get the cigarettes. I put my elbow in this guy's gut, lifted him off the ground, knocked the wind out of him, and I ran. I ran. I knew the general direction of where I needed to go. And so I just went through the Everglades, scared to death. I ran almost all night until I felt I was almost safe. Then I, there was a clearing up ahead. I was following a, um, a canal system that I knew would eventually take me to the, um, to the expressway. And uh, I'm surprised. I'm, this is the first time I've ever shared this. This is how really? I got saved. Um, well, it's always because I always kind of wondered. See, the thing is, I had a contract put on, on me. Mm -hmm. You get a contract put on you, it never gets undone. And that night in this clearing, I thought, you know what? If they know where I'm going, they're waiting here for me. I'm dead. I, what should I do? I didn't, I didn't want to stray off of this area because I'd get lost and get eaten up by an alligator or something. You know? So I figured, well, I'm going to have to chance it. Sure as heck, boom, somebody was hiding and, and took a blast at me with a shotgun. I just dove into a ditch. I pretended like I was dead. I lifted up my head. There's a pickup truck with four guys coming out on the intersection. Then all of a sudden I felt movement behind me and I look and there's a guy with a rifle coming through a plowed farmer's field. They're all headed right towards me. Now, all of us had the same, were from the same unit, had the same training. When you suspect a person that you've hit, you always make a, a secure assurance by shooting them in the back of the neck to make sure they're dead. They didn't do that. Mm. I looked up. I literally pissed my pants. I cried out mama first. Yeah. And then I yeah. said, oh, God, if you're there, help me. Now, I remember the moon just coming up over the horizon. And I passed out. I was gone. I got up. And I couldn't believe I'm still alive. I got up. I looked. The moon was all the way on the other side of the horizon. So I must have been there all down at night. And then I remember the Twilight Zone uh, episode where the guy was actually dead in the, you know, lying down. And he didn't realize it. So I look in a ditch to see if my body's there. And it's not. I pinch myself. Oh, that hurt. Wow, I'm, I'm alive. How can this be? They should have shot me in the back of the neck to ensure that I was gone. So, you know, I, I just said, okay, I got to. I got to keep walking. I know I'm going to hit the, the, um, the base. And I, I keep thinking, man, if I, I'm hitchhiking on the major expressway, they could just pick me up and I'm gone. That's it. So I was a little nervous, but I started hitchhiking. These two gals picked me up. I could back this story up to about eight months before. There was this young gal. I was on my chopper driving down the street, and I was, it was in my neighborhood, so I was pretty familiar with it. It's a fairly safe neighborhood. But I saw this young gal. She was on a little Ducati. But it broke down, so she's walking on the side of the road, and she's scared, looking scared to death. You know, it's like, it's like 12:30 at night. She's all by herself. So I passed her, and I said, "You know what? I got to go back and, and try to, you know, I, where I used to work, a gas station up there. They'll let me use the phone. She can call somebody and and have them pick up. She'll be safe. I need to go back. She looked pretty scared. So I went back, and so here I am, a you know, a grizzly little biker on a Harley chopper, and I probably didn't do much to win her confidence. But I assured her that, you know, look, I'm, you know, I'll help you out. I'm just, you know, down the road here, there's a phone and let's put your bike behind this tree and you'll be all right. So she hopped on my bike. I took her down. She called her husband. Her husband ended up being a president of a major outlaw club that I was kind of a little nervous about because they were heavier duty than I ever was. And he was really thanking me and said, man, if there's anything I can ever do for you. And I said, no, I, well, you know, bike clubs are done. I'm going in the army in a couple months. So I, you know, I'm going to be doing that for the next few years. So I'm hitchhiking off of Palmetto Expressway, trying to get back to the base. Two gals pick me up. And, of course, I got short hair. You know, this is in the 60s, so everybody had long hair. You know, no bald wasn't in back then. Mm -hmm. So these two gals pick me up. She keeps looking at me. She goes, oh, you look familiar. And I said, well, I'm not from around here. 
And she laughed and she said, no, neither am I. She said, you're, you're obviously from the base, right? And I said, yeah, I, you know, I'm in the Army. I'm stationed at Homestead uh, just down the road. And, and then she says, well, where are you from? And I said, oh, I'm probably from somewhere you never heard. I'm, I'm from uh, Detroit, Michigan, actually, in Livonia. And she says, oh, my God, you're him. And I said, huh? She says, I'm from Ann Arbor. I was in Livonia. Were you the guy that? And I said, oh, my God, you're the gal on the Ducati. Oh. And she says, she says, honey, wherever you want to go, I'm going to take you right to the doorstep. Where do you need to go? Wow. I was safe. I got back. We had four men room. And we had one older guy. He was a drunk. He used to get drunk, and we all got high. But he would get drunk, and he'd start rambling on about he used to be a hit man for the singing. He knows all these people in Miami. And we're going, yeah, yeah, okay, Brown, just sleep it off. You know, just we, we just blew him off. And out of desperation, I didn't have anybody else to go to. I went to him, and I explained to him everything that went on. He kind of knew something was going on with my other roommate, you know, with with all these contacts and everything. So I explained to him everything, and he says, don't go anywhere. Don't trust anyone. Stay right there. Now, I already knew. I prayed for the first time in my whole life. I prayed and asked God to save me, help me. And I figured, man, this had to be what God did this. He, he saved my life. Now what's with this guy? So he told me, he says, I'm going to go into town. I'm going to talk to a few people. I'll see what I can do for you. Don't trust anyone. Don't go off base. As long as you're on the base, you're going to be all right. So he came back. He gave me a gun, which I still have to this day as a souvenir mm-hmm. of the Times. But um, he says, um, he says, don't worry, everything's okay. I said, what do you mean? And he says, well, I explained everything to the right people, and, and it's all taken care of. And I said, well, how, you know, how can you do that? How do I know? He says, no, no, well, how are you going to know? Because your buddy's going to have an accident Sunday on his motorcycle, and he's out of here. And I said, well, oh, wait a minute, I'm not having no blood on my hands. He says, no, you don't understand, it's out of your hand. He says, your buddy jumped the gun and exposed himself to others by putting contract out on you before he had all the information. He was wrong. They know he was wrong, so it's going back on him. Your buddy's going to have an accident Sunday. There's nothing that anybody can do about it. So I told him, hey, I'll take my chances. I don't want, you know, I don't want this on my conscience. He says, no, you don't understand. Once a contract goes through, it's going to go through somewhere. Somebody's going down. In this case, your buddy's going down. Mm-hmm. That Sunday, um, October 19th, 1970 is the day I should have died. The, that next following Sunday, he was killed, decapitated on his motorcycle, hit and run accident out in the Everglades. He died. I stayed alive. It took my hard-headed knucklehead four years to find out that the God that saved me was Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior. Um, but that got my attention. I started searching. For the first time in my life, I started searching in a spiritual realm, in nature. I grew up on Darwin. I didn't believe in, you know, in God. So... I was pretty much at that up to that point a hardcore atheist, you might say. But yeah, as you know, say, you know, in a life and death situation, all of a sudden, all of your ideas collapse when you realize I'm not ready for whatever's next. Yeah, everyone has a testimony, and sometimes um, when you really um, just let somebody just really talk, you really get to find out stuff you normally normally wouldn't uh, hear. You know, Jim. You know, with all those things that have happened to you. It's got to frustrate you what's going on with our government now. You know, I'll tell you, Barry, you know, the thing is that I I know from a spiritual realm, and I know that I've got to seek the highest ground, which is to believe and trust and know that God is in control of everything, mm-hmm. that um, it's because we have turned our backs as a nation or even as a church or even as a remnant. We're not doing what we should be doing or this wouldn't be happening to our country right now. Like I said, you go back to Deuteronomy 28th chapter. If my people recall, you know, he says, if you do this, then you can expect this. When you put God first, even your enemies are going to be at peace with you. It's not, yeah. an, you know, well, we got to do this. We got No, if we are right before God, he's going to make our enemies be at peace with us. We don't have to worry about making ourselves vulnerable. But if you forsake him, he says the foreigner is going to be the head. You're going to be the tail. He says you're going to be the beggar. They are going to come in like a marauding army and take you over from within. And yeah. there's nothing I can do about it. So I see that, and I see that going on in our country. And I kind of knew that this was going to happen um, all along. But it's one thing to know it, and it's another thing to actually experience it and live it, to see the hypocrisy, to see the, you know, the erosion of things. Where I'm stuck is probably where a lot of people are stuck today. 
on a spirit realm, I realize, you know, that nothing is going to change, even if we try to make it change, until we return back to God. We're just going to replace one dictator for another form of a dictator. Um, but yet, when I look at my grandchildren, and I go, you know, what if these aren't the last of the last days? What if these are only just progressive steps downward? And I do nothing mm -hmm. to preserve some kind of a future for my grandchildren. What are they going to think if I do nothing and just let things happen? And so a part of me says, you know what? Now, here's, here's what surprised me. If you remember um, not too long ago, now it was, they stated in this article, read everything first. In other words, mm -hmm. read the whole article. Don't jump to conclusions. But what they did was they took the story of the Boston Tea Party and put it as if it was a modern current event. So I get halfway through, not reading the rest of it, and halfway through, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, so it begins. You know, 72 people killed in, in uh, Boston. Um, and it doesn't tell you. It, it progressively leads up so that then you realize that they've just rehashed an old story, putting it in modern times. But at the time you're reading it, you think this is a modern thing. Oh, my gosh, they started firing on our own people. Yeah. I first thought, Barry... I got to find some militia to join. I want to fight. Yeah. It's about time we take this country back from the foreign invaders that have taken it over. And right now, to this day, Barry, if there was some kind of an organization or somebody that would tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, we're getting ready. You want to join? You better believe I do. Where do I sign up? Let's march. You know, we had all the bikers march on Washington. We mm -hmm. had all the truckers march on Washington. When in the heck is the militia going to march? I want to join. I'm a 62-year-old man. It's not in much health, but you know what? I still know how to shoot a gun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, I got to admit in saying that, I'm not probably totally right. Because if I am in an end-time scenario, I'm supposed to love not my life and be as, as Jesus and love not my life, you know, even unto death, setting an example. I'm a resident in kingdom of God before I'm a kingdom or before I'm an American. But I vacillate between the two. And I, in, in total honesty and confession, I don't know if that was set before me today. I don't know what I would do. But that's where, Barry, it's so important for each one of us to make sure that we are really in a personal relationship with the Lord. I finally decided, Barry, I'm not going to rack my mind out trying to say, well, what do I do? What do I do? I know that if I'm walking in the Spirit today, God is going to lead me to do and what not to do tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. I just have to abide faithfully. In God's spirit, don't allow a root of bitterness to make me respond emotionally. Let me stay in the spirit. Now, there are times when Christians have to pick up a gun and defend. And there are times when we are to lay it down and die. I can't tell you. I can't tell anyone else what they should or shouldn't do. This is on such a personal level. We all have to draw closer to God now at this time and seek him out for answers. We may not get uh, abrupt answers. My bottom line is do everything that I know that is the right thing to do today. Don't worry about whether it's going to have any lasting impact. I just do what I know is right. And the rest God's job. He can take care of it. But I continually doing what is right on a one-to-one -one single basis. If something should come to me, now this, I, this part I do believe, I won't go looking for war. But if it comes on my doorstep, I have an instinctive value as a man, as a veteran, as a Christian, to protect my family. If war comes to my door, as much as I would like to lead someone to Christ, don't think for a minute if you're going to kill my kids or my wife or rape her in front of my eyes that I'm going to just sit by and, and pray. I'm going to send you to Jesus right there and now. Mm -hmm. You're going to get a 40 caliber God implant into your brain, and you're going to go <laughs> see Jesus and talk to him right here, right now. Oh, I like I your talking. I, yeah, I, I I think I can say that and stand before God. Um, but I don't know, Barry. I don't know what I'm going to do a year from now. I don't know what I'm going to do uh, a week from now. I know what I need to do, and that is to abide in him and his spirit. Acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will guide your steps. He's going to guide me if I stay faithful to him. If I don't let my emotions rule my actions, but I let the word of God direct my steps and the Holy Spirit I'm going to be okay. And I, I think the options are there that I don't have to be a floor mat, but I don't have to go looking for trouble either. Um, 
the church that I go to, we have a constitutional pastor that, you know, you know, believes in the Bible, but also the constitution and, you know, how the United States was set up by God and different things. Cause you look at our constitution, we have so much what God did in our country. That being said, um, I came across, um, the 63rd Battalion of Light Foot Militia authorized by the Wyoming State Constitution and Second Amendment to the United States Constitution. Uh, as an or, unorganized militia, and they, there was a couple of things that they mentioned. They said, you know, I am prepared to give my life in, in their defense. I'll never surrender I'm under, under my free will. If I'm captured, I will continue to resist by all means if possible. I will place my trust in God, the Constitution of the United States of America, and the loyalty of her people. There's a group called um, Disciple, and um, at the beginning of the show here, I'll have it played. But it says um, it's, a, it's a thrash group, and I heard about them. And they're a Christian group, and they say, um, if you come against my people, you come against my country, there's nothing I can do, but I, you know, I, I cannot, you know, I'm sorry, it says, I must do something, I can't let this happen all over again. Yeah. I know that when I listen to the local radio station, and there's been times I've been putting on YouTube when I hear people calling in, um, they... Um, People are gearing up in here, Wyoming. I mean, they're literally gearing up. Um, what are you hearing out there? Well, you know, I well, I I don't want to divulge too much because sure, you know, sure. it puts me in a rock between a rock and a hard place. But I don't think that there's anything on a large scale being um, mobilized or getting ready to uh, you know to be activated. And that, unfortunately, was something that I always hoped would happen. But I think isolated pockets, because we have a shared belief and a shared sense of, of patriotism, I'm afraid that we're not going to say and do anything until we're occupied. Then it's going to be a pocket movement, just like it was in the French uh, resistance, or like in many of the other um, resistant movements in Europe. And I think that's why the powers that be are already gearing up to make all of these people demonized as if they're the terrorists. We're the freedom fighters. We're not terrorists. But I do think that many pockets of resistance will pop up here and there. Whether they will actually mobilize or or gather later on, that depends. But so far, to my knowledge, there's no strong leadership that is centralizing any of this. It's going to pop up in pockets here and there. But we're going to be provoked into it. You know, I know that David Wilkerson was probably one of the most accurate prophets or prophetic, you know, um, people in the 20th century. He said something that I had a dream of 20, 32 years ago, and that is that I saw most of our major cities gutted out, burned out, mm -hmm. with people randomly looting to just survive. Um, there was rioting all across everywhere. There was the multinational like peacekeeping force. I saw Russians on our soil. I saw um, people from all different, you know, countries speaking different languages that were kind of probably the U the UN. But at, at the time I had this dream, there was, I mean, the UN was just a paper tiger. It wasn't even anything, you know, of any significance. Well, we see that's all changed now. Um, and in this dream, um, I saw our, almost all our major cities gutted out. There was a time of like civil disorder. We were separated and, and fractioned off by race, by political affiliations and by uh, religion. And what the Lord was showing me in this was that all of, you know, the, the Russian troops that we encountered, I was living up north with a group there and we were trying to exchange food uh, that we had for medicine. Uh, so we had to go into Detroit in the inner city part. And when, before we actually went into the city, we were kind of observing cautiously first to make sure it was safe to, to go into this one ministry um, the guy was standing out in front waiting for us, and we had to be careful that we weren't going to be sniped or something, or, you know, somehow there was the fear we couldn't just go in. So we're waiting. Then all of a sudden, we saw people, you know, kind of running in and out, like almost like rats, you know, just grabbing what they could and then hiding and escaping. Then mm -hmm. all of a sudden, we saw, we saw this other group of people, cover, move, cover, move, coming up the street. And then all of a sudden, they all opened up automatic weapon fire. They're killing everybody that was in their way, just mowing everybody down. And in my horror, when I looked, it was our own troops. It was us. Mm -hmm. And what the Lord was showing me was that the worst enemy to fear was not the foreigners coming in. It was what's already inside of our country now. That didn't make sense when I had the dream because that was in 1978. 
we were still in a cold war with russia it didn't make sense now in this dream now this was during probably the longest fast i ever went on i was on a 40-day fast and i was praying because as a young pastor 26 years old um i found myself our clubhouse had been firebombed i was pastoring a christian motorcycle ministry at the time nobody ever heard of such a ministry and in Detroit, we were we came on the scene in the middle of a biker war and a consolidation of one group trying to engulf all the other groups together. And uh, they saw us as maybe running a scam. They didn't believe that we were really Christians on bikes. That was unheard of. So they firebombed in uh, our ministry, and they threatened our lives. And I realized that whatever decision I made from that point on was going to determine not only my life, but 40 families that, that belonged to my ministry. So I was highly motivated to fast and pray and seek out the Lord. So I'm seeking out for survival tactics for right here and right now. And the next thing I know, I get a dream for, now it's been like 36 years ago. And I always wondered, Lord, why did you show me? I'm praying for this and you're showing me that. Why? How does that fit? Now, looking back in retrospect, I understand. Because the Lord supernaturally delivered us more than once. I mean, Old Testament stuff. Where One day they're firebombing us and then he told me, go in, in their clubhouse and warn them. Oh, Lord, they got guns. Like, yeah. Yeah, I can go in there and tell them, well, unto you. I mean, it's like Old Testament stuff. We're not living. Come on, Lord, you got, are you serious? I had to do it, and I did it. And my obedience, the next thing you know, I saw the strong hand of God that could see us through everything. I was spared from guns, knives, baseball bat, and angry fists. And I'm still alive, and some of them aren't. And it's because of the power of God. What the Lord was showing me in all of this is, Jim, what I'm going to do now, to preserve and keep you safe is what you're going to be helping teach others because soon you're all going to be in that same position because your life is about to be totally shook up. Your country is going to be turned inside out, upside down. How I'm going to keep you preserved now is how you're going to teach your, your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, a faithful remnant, that they have the power to be able to go through all of this stuff without being affected. Our days are numbered by the Lord. If we are abiding in his spirit, no weapon formed against us can can come against us. We don't have to suffer the judgments that the ungodly suffer. He can see us through. If he can see Noah through a whole world being destroyed, he can certainly see us through. Because that was the other thing. So, so many Christians, well, we're not going to be here anyway, so it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got good news and bad news. Good news is God is powerful enough that wherever his grace is going to send you, I mean, wherever his will is going to send you, his grace is going to keep you. Bad news is there's no pre-trib rapture. You're not going to get poofed away anywhere. Yep. There's an accountability issue here that we're going to have to be purged. You know, right now we're too busy fighting each other on how do we baptize in the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost, or Jesus' name. Is the Antichrist Pee Wee Herman? Is it Nimrod? Is it Hitler? Is it, uh, <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. Is it a pre-trib, post-trib? Was there a second incursion in Ephraim? Are they here through a bloodline, through a, you know, yada, da 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 I mean, we're doing the same thing within our realm. We're starting to do the same thing the church is. We're dividing ourselves by doctrine. Oh, my God, you're a Calvinist. You're an Arminius. Like, we can't have fellowship. Yeah, we can't work. Yeah, we can. So what is going to unify us as a body? Probably some of us are so doggone bullheaded until we are all loaded up to the same FEMA camp going to be executed because we believe in the same Jesus, all of a sudden it's not going to be important whether we baptize in the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, or in Jesus' name. All of a sudden it's not going to matter whether we are post-trib, pre-trib, mid-trib, pan-trib. We're going to set those things aside because we're going to be shook into the reality that, you know what, we're all dying for the same Lord, so we better just get learn to get along and get it to, get our act together. Yeah. Um, yeah, Jim, you know, I'm working with the county commissioner. Uh, he he's a patriot. Um, he's actually was elected with a Tea Party. Um, basically, you know, I'll call him up once a week, and he'll say, "Okay, this is what the what the fight is this time." Uh, right now, um, he's just trying to do things locally. One of the things he's trying to do also is um, we have a gentleman, Taylor Haynes. He's running for governor. Um, will be for 2014. He's a born again Christian, constitutional man. Um, of course, we also have a state superintendent. She got all her powers taken away by the legislature, and then the governor voted, voted, um, you know, or signed it. 
it was all because she voted against Common Core. You've heard about Common Core. Oh, yes, definitely. Yep. Yeah, and so they took her powers away. Now she's fighting it. It's going to the court now. People are fighting things, different things, but my gosh, Jim, it just seems like it's coming from all directions. And it gets me is people think that everything is just going to go on the next year and the year after that, and, and it's going to be fine. And they don't realize they haven't woke up to the fact that, hey, things are coming to a head. Yeah, they are. And, you know, Barry, that's that's what I said earlier. we got to keep doing what is right, whether we think it's going to have an impact or change anything or not. I, that doesn't matter. That's not up to us. Let's no. keep fighting. Let's go down fighting. Every opportunity we get to put a representative in there that's godly, that is right before God, we need to do that. We need to support it. You can say, oh, well, I can't vote third party because they're never going to get anyway. You know what? I don't care. It's still the right thing to do. Do it. Yeah. If every Christian would do that. Barry, you know, you were sharing with me, you don't even think there's going to be another election. I, yeah. That wouldn't surprise me. That's a very possible reality, although there might be something else going on, too. I only yeah. with you, well, obviously, Barry, you have noticed there is a red shift going on in politics. Oh, yeah. The, the, the progressive Democrats, as, as they call themselves now, they're not afraid to say they're communist or socialist yeah. now. They're flaming socialists, and they flaunt it. They say they are. Um, what's this recent mayor? that is a communist that was elected in by popular vote. New York. Is a communist. It's like, my God, what is going on here? And now look at the GOP. Yep. 30 years ago, almost all of the members of the Republican Party would have been called flaming liberals. And who are they starting to attack as saying they're radicals? The Tea Party members. Yep. Only true conservatives that exist in this country anymore. So what I see is a demonization by the Republicans on the Tea Party and who are we going to get for a presidential candidate on the next party? Chris Christie? Oh, no. What's up with that? I mean, the guy's so liberal. He's not, you know, he's a Republican in the name, but he's a rhino is a rhino is a rhino that I yeah. see. And, um, oh, governor of Arizona. Why can't I? Oh, goodness. yeah. Um, yeah, she's got the blonde hair. I am. He's thinking about running again. Really? It's like, come on. You're not. So here's. Barry, here's what I see happening. The GOP is going to get another unelectable person. Yep. And there's still some people that are going to say less are two evils. I'm not one of them. If the Tea Party or the Constitutionalist Party or anybody is going to run that best represents the Constitution, I'm going to vote for them. Yep. I'm not yep. going to vote for the lesser two evils. Lesser two evils what? It's like I did a graphic. It shows an American eagle. But the left wing has got the... Um, superimposed over its entire wing is a, the hammer and sickle and the right wing is got the Nazi swastika. It's like, how do what flavor do you want your national socialism? Yeah. Unless there are two evils, my foot, you're going to get national socialism, communist socialism. You know what? Socialism and socialism. That's what's going to be fed crammed down your throat. So however you like the flavor, you're still getting it both. You know, they're, they're both on the same side. Then I've got the little United Nations symbol in the center. It's still new world order. So yeah. we need to fight that in however means that we can through government, through whatever, however means that's available that God puts before us. We don't look at the possible outcomes. Oh, if I vote for here, my vote is no. Be obedient. Do what is right. Here's a man that's best representing you. He's in a little tiny third party. But you know what? If we all band together and do what the right thing is, maybe there'll be a good outcome. But it can't I, be if we just give up. Yeah, I hear northern Michigan, I think it's even north of you, is really getting conservative, and they want to actually even pull out. I've been hearing about Well, the Upper Peninsula has always wanted to su succeed from <laughs> from the rest of Michigan, and uh, and I can almost see why. Because, uh, you know, as soon as you cross that bridge and you're on the other side, it's a whole different environment, a whole different culture. Um, it is very different. Um, I hope it doesn't happen. I hope we all stay united as Michigan, but... You know, quite frankly, when I see the demographics and everything, uh, uh, my feelings are that when this state of anarchy happens, um, I'm in enemy territory, knee deep in enemy territory. Yeah. Might want to head towards Texas or something. I don't know. But <laughs> and then again, maybe like Dietrich Bonhoeff, maybe I'm supposed to stay behind enemy lines. Uh, one thing that I can guarantee you is that nobody is going to intimidate me to be silent. Obviously, we're on this program here and I'm expressing my feelings totally. I do it on Facebook. I do it on all my videos. I earned my red dot. I want my red dot. Come and get me. <laughs> I will be the first because you know what's going to happen to me? 
God's going to wake me up in the middle of the night and say, it's time to get out of Dodge now, leave. Go, yeah, I, I believe... He did it with Paul. He's going to do it with me. Not that I'm a Paul, but I have that same spirit that I am not going to quench or cower or be afraid. I am in a win-win situation, and I will keep proclaiming the word of God and the kingdom of God in a constitutional American republic as long as I have breath in my uh, lungs. And I may not take up a gun and fight, but you know what? Everybody and anybody in that day and moment that does, that's supporting a constitutional republic, I am going to support them to my death. Yeah. And I will never betray them because I am a veteran. And I did take an oath to defend this country from foreign or domestic terrorists. And right now we've got a actually a foreign terrorist in office yep. saying he's our president. Yeah, you know, and uh, I just bought myself another gun. <laughs> I like buying guns. Hey. Well, you know, I hate to say this. I used to have all kinds of unregistered guns. Yeah. And they're not on, and it's under the grandfather law. I don't have to do anything with them. Oh, no. Nice. I fell into hard times. I got rid of all of them. Man, I wish oh. I wouldn't have done that. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah, you know, well, yeah, I know that happens to people out here, even in Wyoming. You know, um, but you know just, what, Barry? I know the people and I have the technology working in um, auto prototype. Yeah. You'd be surprised what you can do out of machinery. If you have the know-how and the skill, you can make your own fun toys and, you know. <laughs> Who, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know I, I can't divulge myself, but I'm hearing a lot from a lot of people uh, as I work and different stuff I come across. But there's people out here that are doing certain things, too. And, uh, you know, um, I don't know. Have you ever heard of the readout? Have you ever heard of the American readout region? No, I haven't. No, but it's I understand the concept of what the idea would be. Obviously, sure. well, first of all, readout is known as a fortress. Um, it's hard to penetrate type fortress. Mm -hmm. um, it was based on a book back in 2011. I couldn't tell you who it was uh, offhand, but it's based on Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho, where all the Christians and patriots are moving to. And there's actually a gentleman that's actually got radio free readout now. And um, I've been listening to it, and he's a Christian. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people out this way moving. And, of course, the person that's sitting next to me, he just moved up from Colorado and got a job here in Wyoming. There's more people from the church in Colorado that are moving or want to move up here because of the taxes. Um, you know, just everything is getting flaming liberal. And matter yeah. of fact, I was just down there in um, Colorado last weekend talking to a guy at a pawn shop, and he said, we got talking about the guns and different stuff like that. And what's so sad is like a 30, if a clip or a gun comes with a 30 round clip comes in, they have to call the police and they have to dispose of it. Or he sends it to the other pawn shop up here in Cheyenne and then he can sell it. Um, but he told me, he says, you know, I'm not giving my guns up. They can come and take them. And I looked at him. I said, you know what? If you give your guns up, you are giving up liberty and freedom. And you can't do that. You just can't do those uh, th those things. Because once you give up your guns, Jim, you basically say, hey, I'm yours. My dog ate mine. <laughs> yeah. get my, my dog ate it or, you know, I, it got stolen. I lost it. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Um, although I heard some of the rumors I heard is that they're going to use the Chinese or the um, some of the other foreign troops to come and confiscate the guns. Yeah. And, of course, you know, they won't hesitate to use any kind of uh, force to do that. Um, that's where I do know that there's pockets of people that have already sworn an oath to one another that if they're ever called to turn on the American public, they will not do it. Yeah. They will turn on the ones that are willing to do it. But, you know, you can already you can already see. Look at all these generals. They're suddenly, for one reason or another, in a wide variety of reasons, yep. moral yep. in, you know, um, infringements or whatever, uh, whatever trumped up things. All of a sudden, a lot of these are purged. Now, anybody that's read history, that same thing happened in Russia, the same thing happened in Germany. All of those that were undesirable, that weren't uh, happening on the good old bandwagon with the rest of the regime, were eliminated or taken out. And gosh, if you can't see that this is a purge going on within our government, those generals that have integrity, that understand an American constitutional republic, are being taken out. Yeah. And then look at look at the head of um, home security, homeland security. He's a member of the. I mean, he had a website proclaiming the death of all white Americans, yeah. and uh, he was a confirmed hardcore member of the. Uh, 
the Muslim Brotherhood. What's how how can this happen? Why does he still have a job? Yeah. I mean, well, come on, where does this end, man? I know. And uh, you know it is. I mean, who knew that we would live in these days? Um, you know, and that and now of course now you might have heard of this too. But the last lead smelter is being shut down by EPA in uh, St. Louis, Missouri next month. Mm -hmm. And, you know, hey, yeah. so, you know, 22 bolts will get harder to find. Other things that have, like, lead on the front, you won't be able to find. Um, they say they'll come in from China. Yeah, right. George Soros, international socialist, has been buying up American gun companies and ammunition companies. Yeah. So he can control it. He sure. wants, you know, he, I mean, he's one of the richest men in the world. No, my Bible, you know, when people say, oh, you know, this conspiracy stuff, it's just crazy. And granted, true, there is mild to wild crazy stuff. Some stuff is just insane. But if you do your homework, you realize, and this is what I challenge everybody. You know what? A global conspiracy is scriptural. It's in the Bible. 17th chapter of Revelation, verse uh, 12, I think it is. And there are 10 men that have received no power as kings yet, but have power as kings and will give their power willingly unto the beast, for they have one mind. Man, if that isn't, I mean, look at the breakdown of that scripture in a sentence structure. Yep. Here's 10 people that have no power. They have no actual kingdom, but they have the power of kings. They have the resources of entire governments, and they give that willingly to the beast. I think the beast here is not talking about the person, but the, the whole conglomerated, you know, power force structure. They give that because they're in league with them. Now, isn't it amazing that the United Nations has the world carved out into 10 different sections? It's like this is their ultimate utopia on earth, a, a global socialist government with 10 sections. Duh, 10 rich people, the same names that keep popping up all throughout history that have been the invisible hand controlling all of this stuff. You think these 10 people are throwing in their whole investment because they're going to get one tenth of the world as their own personal control? I think mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And there's uh, your conspiracy. It's biblical. It's scriptural. Don't argue with my little paranoid brain. Argue with the word of God. He knew that this was coming down just this way beforehand. We got people that will call the local radio station mentioning about home Department of Homeland Security buying up ammo and just different things. Right. And there's always one guy's always got to call up. His name is Ron. I won't name his last name. And he's like, oh, that's conspiracy. And I'm like, wait a second here. It's right there in the news if you guys would just look for it. And – Jim, why is why why do we got to have these people that always got to dog the people that are trying to bring out the truth? It's like if I go to work and tell people about something, they're like, well, "Where did you see that?" I says, "Well, the place that you're not looking." <laughs> exactly. You know? Yeah. Hey, Jim. It's too late. You, you know what the definition of a democracy is? Mob rules. Well, it's two wolves <laughs> with a sheep discussing. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but I've seen that one. It's yeah. good. Uh, but you, <laughs> but you, I have one better for you. You know what the definition of a republic is? Hmm. A sheep armed with guns disputing the vote. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I. How about the one? Uh, I'm sure you've heard this one. Jim, I think I lost you. I think I lost your audio there, Jim. Actually, I think I just lost you totally. Jim? I'll call you right back. I see. Yep, did this. We lost Jim Williamson. Oh, hey, I'm Jim. Back again, I think. Can you okay. hear me? I sure can. Okay, well, yeah, I guess they didn't want to hear this joke. Uh, well, now that I'm determined to say, okay, so a communist, a Muslim, and an illegal alien enter into the bar. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Okay, we're still on good. Okay. Yep. And they go up to the bartender to order something, and the bartender says, oh, what do you have, Mr. President? Oh, <laughs> that's good. I like that. <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, well, and it's true. Yeah. And even that is hotly debated. You know, I mean, why are, why are the guy has never shown a birth certificate? And there's so much evidence that, you know, that, that he was a foreign exchange student. He was in a country in Indonesia where you could, where you had to renounce whatever prior citizenship you had anyway. I mean, oh gosh, there's just so much. You know, even some of the wild stuff where they showed Obama's entire family and they compared to one of the pharaohs and his wife and everything. And I'm going, you know what? I actually have a scripture, Barry, that can maybe support that idea 
What's that? And it's a scripture in Job uh, 38th chapter. It says that the, the Antichrist would plow up the depths of heaven or the plow up the depths of hell. Literally plowing up means resurrecting some of these people. How do you do that? Well, cloning. They're already talking that, you know, we have enough DNA material from some of these mummies. We could we could clone them back. Sure. sure and sure, my little sure. mind is saying, you know what? What if our what if our conscious mind is DNA tagged to our bodies? Hmm. Maybe that's why the Egyptians were so preoccupied with preserving the human body. Well, did you ever see that movie called Return to Me? No, I haven't. You got to watch no. that sometime. Uh, um, where do you? That's uh, yeah, that's interesting. I'll have to check that out. Uh, do you have Netflix? Yeah. Okay, check it out. It's called Return to Me, and basically the whole synopsis of the movie is this: a guy is married to his wife, and then of course, then she dies in a tragic accident. A lady receives her heart. Well, I'm going to let the uh, let you uh, watch the movie because it, oh, it'll make you, it'll make you. Know, you uh, more, they're finding out that that different organs in our body may have certain uh, memories, sure, that are actually DNA tagged to our physical body, so that as people experience transplants, they're actually yep. getting some of the attributes and memories that they never had before. Um, this isn't science fiction. This is stuff that we're beginning to really understand is uh, real. So yeah, that's pretty interesting. Hey, I got one for you, Barry. I don't know okay. if you did you did you ever see my time travel series? Uh, I know it's long; it's like six hours. But you know, I got to tell you, the last few series that I've done, I was faced with a life and death medical situation, and I thought I was dying, and I wasn't sure. So all of a sudden, I'm forced with, "Oh my gosh, I got my book out!" But you know what? I've got all this other new information that I've never had printed, or it's not recorded anywhere. I could take this to the grave with me. I can't do that. So what I did out of desperation, the last few series I have, uh, Angels, Demons, Nephilim, uh, Aliens, um, The Three Frogs, and this other series on time travel, um, is mostly information that I didn't have recorded anywhere. And I was so scared to death, I did not want to die with this going with me. So I put it out. So I realized that this video series contains such a massive amount of information that nobody can actually sit down listen to it and retain any of it. It's like I almost made it as a last will and testament as kind of a um, a reference so that you can continually go back and see all the scriptures and how they pertain to what. Because I'm very anchored on the fact that if I'm going to tell you something is, um, then I'm going to support it by chapter, text, and verse of scriptures. Not only pulled out, but rightly divided so that the Bible interprets itself by itself. So it's cram-packed with a lot of information. But in that series... I told you about whatever all the things that happened to me in Stevensville, Texas. Mm -hmm. There is a movie I found out afterwards, and I got it in my, the second part of the four-part series on time travel. There's a movie called The Yesterday Machine. I freaked okay. out when I saw this. The Yesterday Machine, made in 1962, a year before Kecksburg uh, crash, 1962. This is a movie about a news reporter going out to find out about a a young kid that was shot, but he was shot rather unusual by what he said was a guy dressed up like a Confederate soldier. They pulled the bullet out of his leg, and it was a musket ball, typical of uh, 1865, uh, what the Confederates used. The guy dropped his hat, so they did a search on the hat. This was a, a legitimate Civil War hat by a company that was burnt down during the Civil War, so this thing shouldn't even exist. So... Hmm. The newspaper reporter is kind of wondering. So he's going around. He decided to go to the local city's chief, uh, police chief. The city he was in was te uh, Stevensville, Texas. The police chief says, well, you know, this reminds me of something that happened at the end of World War II. I was a troop. We came upon this city that we overran, and we discovered that the Nazis were working on time travel there. And he says, what, you're trying to tell me this has got something to do with time travel? He says, no, I'm not telling you anything. I'm just saying it's kind of similar. Long story short, the guy ends up running into a, uh, an escaped Nazi that was working on time travel in Stevensville, Texas. And then when he's confronting this guy, this guy goes off on a crazy rant that is almost everything that's in my book. Oh, wow. 1962. Let's... What in the heck? 1962. Now, here's the weirdest thing. The name of the reporter that was sent to, you know, that found all of this out. And I didn't know this until I was splicing it all together to put it in my video. His name was Jim. Oh, really? That just kind of, that just kind of blew my mind. Now, you know, 
I, am I reading into it? Maybe, I don't know, but I just can't explain how in 1962 they lay out a whole thing about Stevensville, Texas, about time travel, about the police chief knowing something uh, significant, you know, making the link and the connection and an escaped Nazi working on time travel. That's everything that I experienced down in Stevensville, Texas. So weird. Now, you know, I truly believe that just as um, Dave Flynn had that crop circle in, in mm -hmm. Crabwell, um, that was an exact copy of his logo for his, um, you know, his uh, computer company. Um, that was, that was singled. He was singled out in that situation. I'm not saying necessarily that I am in this movie, but it sure looks like it. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's not that I'm in, and I I'll even bring that part up, not because I think I'm so special or anything, but you know what, Barry, it could be that many of us doing our research as we find out these plans that the enemy has, maybe all of us have been targeted in some way or another. So if that pattern exists, I wanted that to be on record. Now I do it in a humorous way. So it look kind of, I'm kind of like making fun of my own self, you know, in this thing. And I think that's the only way I could put it. And, and I don't mind that. I'm gosh, I'm so used to being laughed at. Now I, if I, people stop laughing, I don't think I know how to handle it. Sure. But, but um, I wanted there. So if there is a pattern, other people sometime in the future will make a connection so that if they think, Oh my gosh, is this really, you know, me or am I, is it just me or, well, maybe this will help them out. Yeah. It happened to Dave. It happened to me. I'm sure, you know, I'm not anything special, any different than anyone else. We get too close to the truth. Weird stuff happens. So I'm sure it's going to happen to a lot of others. I, I actually think somewhere down the line, L.A. Mazzulli right now with his Nephilim skull thing, he's doing a fantastic amount of work. I spent the weekend with him at his place. He showed me, you know, all the things he's working on and everything. Just fantastic. And I think more and more people are going to come from behind the computer and doing the research, and they're going to get personally involved, going out and investigating tromping all over the world, you know, in deserts and, and other ungodly weird places, looking for firsthand answers. And as we do that, and we're willing to take on more responsibility, we're going to we're gonna beat on the hornet's nest, and we're going to stir things up. And so that might be some ways that, you know, who knows, maybe there's a video game coming out that's going to actually portray stuff that, um, that L.A. Marzulli is working on or that others are uh, researching now. I heard Stan Dale is taking a serious look about the hollow earth and about... Um, uh, time travel. I'm excited. That guy's educated right in that area. He can do a much better job than I can. So maybe I can blab it out and be the kook, but you know what? It's tipping other people who are more specified in those areas to do research and they'll take it the next step. And that's a good thing. But I think it'll have its negative repercussions and it might be found in the next Hollywood movie. It might be in uh, uh, a video game. I mean, this stuff is going to come up in the most obscure, weird ways so that people go, oh, yeah, I saw that movie. You know, it's, yeah, you're just a victim of too much uh, science fiction or whatever. Whatever it takes to make make it unbelievable, the enemy's certainly going to do that to keep the people from seeing the truth or knowing the truth. Yeah. Um, you know, there's just so much that's going on. It's so hard to keep up with it all. I mean, you probably look at the news and you're probably almost flabbergasted by what, everything that's going on anymore. Oh, gosh. You know, it's like, I mean, I even, you know, with that dream, I knew these things would happen. But it's, you know, when you actually see, oh, my gosh, we're here. Finally, it's it's here. And I got to pinch myself. Is this real? This yeah. is too surrealistic. It's weird. I can't believe it's actually happening. But it is. You know, look at Fukushima. My oh, gosh. I know. You know, when Jesus said, except these days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. You look at Fukushima and compare it to Chernobyl. Mary, it's life. 60 years from now, the whole world's going to be dead from leukemia or, or from cancer, from the, the effects of radioactivity. It's well, just going to happen. So God is not going to let that happen. He's going to shorten the days because uh -huh. he's going to take over before that happens. So except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, I will shorten these days. So how close are we to the end times? Uh, pretty close. Yeah, you know, uh, gosh... Um, there's something I was going to mention and I totally forgot. I'm uh, sorry. You know me. No, I no, 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 <laughs> no, no, I'm just sitting here looking at some news stories and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I, I guess, um, I mean, I'll, 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 it'll, it'll come back to me, you know, just even like today with, uh, Harry reading that, that, you know, they're doing away with, uh, um, I don't know. It takes like what 67 senators to have something 
to get approved, and now they're destroying it, and they're getting down to like sixty or fifty-one or something like that. Um, laws are not being, uh, you know, held up to. Um, it's just kind of everything's just being slammed, and I don't know. Um, I, I, I like your. Uh, I think you're like you're right. I think that we don't have a whole lot of time. Um, you know, of course, we're hooking up with more people that have a commonality because things are going to fall apart where, you know, there'll be people living in people's houses. It won't be like, you know, you're, you know, you could have a couple of different families living in a house. You know what I'm excited about, Barry, what's happened recently in my um, area is I've getting more and more African-Americans that are interested in what I'm doing. One, a minister in a, in a church in Detroit, they really get a good grasp on what's going on. Yeah. And I'm, yeah. I'm excited about that because I, part of the scenario that I saw is that, when the rioting happens in the major cities, it's going to take on a color. and It's going to be black against white. Sure, it's going to be a sure. horrible thing, man. And I see God already in his grace and mercy trying to forge alliances so that we can be a unified voice, black and white, saying, look, there's only one race. It's a human race. Look past. The powers that be are trying to make us be against each other. Um, we've just got to see it from the kingdom's way. There's only one race, and that's a human race. Let's get on that side and, and forget about, you know, the polarization that the enemy is trying to do with us. And and I see him trying to establish a voice of reason. But I think things are going to really just, you know, explode in a lot of different ways. What I saw in that dream back in 1978 was almost like if, um, now, I don't know, you're you're kind of close to my age, aren't you? Um, 42. Oh, okay. No, you're not. You're my son's age, actually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, but, you know, the thing is that if you, well, you you got a good handle on history, though, so I know you're going to you catch this. You know, back in the 70s, and this is what brought a huge influx of um, of Muslims into our country, and specifically in the Dearborn area. But after the Civil War in, um, in Lebanon, that was kind of a unique war because it wasn't just one group against another group. Lebanon was divided by so many different factions. Some of it was based on political affiliation. The Muslims were fighting each other. You had the Shiite and the Sunni Muslims, uh, which hate each other as much as um, they would hate Jews and, and uh, uh, Muslims. So, I mean, there were so many different groups fighting each other. You had to keep a scorecard to even know who in the heck you were fighting. Um, you know, there was there was factions on race, on uh, political affiliation, religious affiliation. And so what the Lord was showing me is that what happened there is going to happen in America. We're going to be divided by race, by political affiliation and by uh, religion. And so it's going to be so scattered. There's going to be pockets of people fighting for different reasons. Some are going to be alliance. Some are going to be enemies. I mean, it's going to be a very confusing time. I think they're going to divide so much that there won't be a single unified body that will be able to fight or re effectively resist um, the overall problem. But this is where uh, George Washington's vision comes into hand. I think we've, yes. we've talked about it before. You know, where it, it in this three-part vision, it was a vision that apparently that George Washington got from a female angel. That uh, red flags go off right away. Angels have never manifested themselves in the female gender they've always been male the only two times examples of any kind of female type angelic being has been false ones so that should be a warning right there the other thing with this with this vision he you know was told that the revolutionary war would be won by the americans then there would be another war north and south that the union would prevail and then the last one would be a multinational basically uh, force that came over to America that was fighting, uh, you know, and everything. And right at a time when it looked like uh, the true Americans were going to be overwhelmed, white spirits appear from the heavens and come to the aid of America and uh, reestablishes a united uh, America and defeats the enemy, the multinational enemy. Mm -hmm. White spirits come from the heavens. Hmm. Nordics, the good aliens. I mean, come on, it just screams, you know, something weird. It fulfills the expectation of almost any replacement theology, whereby America is now Israel. The battle isn't going to be there. Apparently, uh, Jesus isn't going to touch on the Mount of Olives. It's apparently going to be Mount Rushmore. And the, the plains of the Valley of Megiddo isn't going to be there. It's going to be in the Oklahoma, Kansas plains or something. I mean, you know, replacement theology has, has tried to assume this kind of a New Testament version of, of the Old Testament um, way so it's not literally going to happen in Israel, it's happening in America. 
I don't agree with that. I think there's some elements of truth, but I believe in a transitional thing, not mm -hmm. a total replacement. And I think that's where the, the deception is going to be. So whatever happens in America may be the catalyst to introduce this phony cosmic Christ, maybe even during a, um, a phony rapture. I'm not sure how it plays out. I think on my part, and this is what I try to preach to everybody and anybody, don't get dogmatic and lock yourself into one specific scenario. Don't assume mm -hmm. that you know that everything's going to happen a certain way. What I do, even on the material that I think I have gotten from the Lord, and I've taken the time to examine through the scriptures to find scripture, even I am always leaving an open end that I could be wrong, or I don't have the full picture. I don't think any one individual does. I think God wants us to come together to set aside our differences so that we can work together each one has a piece that fits into a total picture. So what I tell people is anything that hasn't happened yet in a way of prophecy, keep an open mind. If you have five or six different scenarios, but they can be supported and backed by Scripture, then don't throw it away. Even if it goes against what I'm saying, I'm going to consider all the other viable options that have Scripture to back and support it. That way, when things do happen, I have a resource pool to draw from. And probably what is actually going to be true is it'll be a composite of five or six different elements of each possible scenario. And if I keep my mind open to that, I'm going to get it. But if I don't, if I'm dogmatic about something, well, it's got to happen this way, then I'm going to be no different than the Jews that are saying to Jesus. Here they are talking right to Jesus saying, well, we know when Messiah comes, he's going to set us free from the Romans. He's going to do this, 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 this. Man, you are so locked up into your own doctrine. You don't even see that everything you ever hoped for is standing right in front of you, and you are instructing that person on how things are going to be. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get that way. If the Bible teaches us anything, prophecy and the things that happen in the future are going to be like a time-release capsule. We're going to know when we need to know, and we're not going to know too much ahead of time because then we're going to mess it up. I mean, if we all knew exactly who the Antichrist was or some kind of element of prophecy and it was a bad thing, we're all going to try to stop it from happening. If it's something good, we're going to help God out to make it happen. It's as if, you know, we could actually do that anyway. But it's just our natural inclination. So God doesn't let us know too much so that we can spoil or interfere. Just like Peter, when, when Peter realized that Jesus was going to go to the cross, he goes, he stood in front of him and said, no, you know, try to stop him. What would Jesus reply? He said, get behind me, Satan. So even in thinking we're doing good, we're end up doing bad. So I don't think we know all the detail. Because God does not want us to put our faith in assumed events. He wants us to keep our faith in Him by living a day-to-day -day life in Him, being led of His Spirit, then tomorrow is going to take care of itself. So the what-ifs, I don't like to play the what-if game. Well, what if this, what if that? Well, what if Jesus Christ is the Lord and He's got everything in control? And what if I just remain patient and wait on Him? Do what I know is supposed to do right here today and tomorrow's going to take care of itself. So even in, you know, we need to fight. We need to fight the enemy that's in office right now. We need to fight the administration and all of the other mm -hmm. infiltrators that are trying to corrupt and destroy America. We need to fight it in whatever way that we possibly can, not expecting any kind of outcome, just doing it because it's the right thing to do. Yeah, and, true. you know, I think so many people don't end up doing the right thing because, well, it's not going to make a difference anyway. Well, how do you know if you don't just go ahead and obey and do what you know is right and don't worry about the outcome? The outcome, okay, it's going to be negative, but you know what? Why should that stop you from doing what you know is right? Do it. Just do it. Don't worry about the end of it. Just do it today. Tomorrow. Who knows? If you and everyone else did it, then all of a sudden we've got, um, we've got a Christian that becomes a president because everybody voted a third-party ticket for the person that needed to be in there. But if everybody go, well, they're not going to win anyway. They, it's, they don't have no chance. They're small, unknown, yada, yada, yada. You know, no. Don't assume anything. Just do what is the right thing to do because it's the right thing to do. And then whatever outcome, at least you did your part and did the right thing. So this year, Barry, I am not, or this year, I mean, 2016, <laughs> I am not settling for the lesser of two evils because there's no such thing. Evil is still evil. Yeah take whoever best represents the kingdom of heaven.